Hi, everyone. My name is Diana Boros, and welcome to another episode of Hosting Art. Hosting Art is supported by both the Guestbook Project and the Psychological Humanities and Ethics Center at Boston College. I'm Professor of Political Theory at St. Mary's College in Maryland, and I'm here today with my friend, the artist, Ed Woodham, someone whose humor-filled and interventionist approach to public art making has long inspired me and my teaching and my research. Um, Ed has had a long and rich career in the arts spanning over 45 years. He is artist, educator, producer, curator. He teaches at the School of Visual Arts and has taught workshops on political public performance at Emerge NYC, both in New York. His artistic practices focus on, focuses on community art, socially engaged art, and public performance art. Just as some examples of the sort of civic and community-minded work that he has engaged in. Um, in the 90s, he created 800 East. This is in Atlantic, Georgia, where he turned a derelict space into a community arts center, reviving and sustaining both an artistic collective and the local neighborhood in the process. Then on the heels of that experience, he founded the now well-known Art in Odd Places project. Uh, this project consists of a yearly event where visual art, performance art, installations are enacted on the streets of Manhattan over the course of a weekend. This year, it is coming up very soon. It will be taking over 14th Street, October 13th through the 15th. Um, besides New York City, AIOP, Art in Odd Places, has also been produced in Los Angeles, California, Boston, Massachusetts, Indianapolis, Greensboro, Orlando, St. Petersburg, Russia, Sydney, Australia. It was also selected as a representative in the U.S. Pavilion Spontaneous Interventions Design Actions for the Common Good, what a great title, at the Venice Architecture Biennial in 2012. Um, Ed has also given two wonderful TED Talks. I highly recommend them. I love them both. And one TED Educator Talk. So whew, what an introduction. Ed, thank you so much for being here today and talking with me. I'm truly so happy. So welcome. My pleasure. Um, I, I wanted, so there's a lot we, that we just heard in that introduction about all this, sort of the work that you do. Um, what I think I love most about your work is not only your sort of approach to it, which I want to talk about, um, your very sort of unique approach to it, which is, which is fun and joyful and funny, um, and surprising, um, but also that you take so seriously and you're so passionate about combining all of these, all of these all of these different realms. So not just art making, but in the community and neighborhoods and public space and urban areas and urban revi you know, urban revitalization and sort of working with communities to make art um, is as much a part of your practice as your more personal sort of art making. And I just I feel like that's needs to be done more and more and needs to be talked about. So I thought today I would start by asking you about some of your most recent performances, because there were two in, I believe, the last two weeks. Am I right about that? Um, right. And you sent me some photos. They're great. I'll include links um, below the video to to your work, um, to Art Nod Places, but also some of these um, some of these recent performances. Can you tell us a little bit about what these performances were and sort of why and how you created them and how they turned out, how you feel about them? Well, working with the New York State Preservation League um, and the Empire Station Coalition um, and a, a huge team of people um, that made it happen, I did a project called The Keepers. And The Keepers are otherworldly entities, part animal, part plant that look like seaweed creatures, I guess, is what I've been told. And in actuality, they're, um, they're appropriated ghillie suits, which are used for um, hunting and military tactical um, mm. work. And so um, they appear when life is out of balance with nature. And so um, there was a, a, a grant uh, from the New York State Preservation League that was specific to, it's called, um, seven to save i think that's the title and it's particular places or neighborhoods or buildings that are up for either demolition or um to be um well there are most of the places are up for demolition so uh in the particular project i was working on it was um in the penn station neighborhood 
and um, Hotel Pennsylvania completely demolished already. And so um, these keepers appear when the there's this disregard of mm -hmm. developers for the for, for the history of the neighborhood, for the uh, density of the neighborhood, because what's going to happen, for instance, at the Hotel Pennsylvania, uh, which was one of a historically one of the largest hotels in the world uh, for a number of years, they're going to put up another pencil tower um, that is going to house thousands and thousands of people with no um, concern about the history of the neighborhood, with no um, thought about the, the, the density, the human, um, the effects on, on, on the environment there. And uh, other places where we staged the work was the um, St. John the Baptist Catholic Church on 30th Street. Um, they were very, very helpful, and we staged the project out of there. Um, we started at, uh, we met and started at 5.30 in the morning and to hit um, sort of as a ritual to have, to, to be there when the sun was coming up and encounter that part of New York that, that is very active at that time. And if you're not awake at that time, you, you wouldn't know it. Yeah. And, um, and to also um, just capture the commuter energy as well uh, uh, that was happening. So we were standing on the steps of the church Actually, we were standing in the back of the church in an empty lot at six o'clock. Um, and how and many? That, how many people were were part were of five, the five keepers? And okay. there were two new characters called the um, chasers, which are like storm chasers, and they were there to sort of help guide the, the keepers because it's a full body suit; you can't see through it. And so, oh, you can't see through it at all. Well, you can see through it, but it, it, you can't really navigate well. You okay. can. See but you can't really, um, you know, you don't have good peripheral vision. Right. The photographs is you have to see the photographs for it to make sense, really. Yeah, they're great. Stuff. They're great, great suits. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, I think you have a, a long history of using performance, using what, I mean, if anyone saw, you know, came around early in the morning, walking down the street and saw you all in these suits, they would be at the very least surprised, <laughs> you know, possibly they would, they would laugh. They would, they would maybe be scared for a minute. It's, it's really sort of, it, it is a, a considerable intervention in that space. Right. And you're doing it for political purposes, right? You're doing it to raise attention to what is going on in the neighborhood. You're calling attention to political and economic sort of changes. Um, and you're wanting to include the community. Ultimately, like you're wanting to call attention to the history and to those that are actually living in that neighborhood rather than just allowing sort of the powers that be to come in and change that neighborhood without the, the, you know, input of those that are living there and those that have experienced that neighborhood. And, you know, from other conversations we've had, I know that you have a long history of, of being engaged in these types of projects and using art to try to make political change, right? To call attention to, to a, a particular situation. Um, I had mentioned in the introduction that I gave for you the project that you did some time ago back in Georgia, where you sort of took this also a derelict space. I don't know if it was up for demolition, but probably a similarly sort of rundown space. And you completely sort of brought it back to life in a way that aided the community, also brought artists together and made art and sort of created that type of aesthetic um, and spiritual value for the space, but also like helped the community, right? Brought and made a space that was run down into something that was alive and vibrant and giving, you know, providing service. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that experience and sort of maybe things that you've learned from it? Well, the, the space was called 800 East and um, it was um, discovered by um, a friend and colleague, Bill Marar, and Neil Freed and I um, homesteaded it. And uh, I, in particular, I mean, I, I stayed there in a crack, sort of, a, it was a crack riddled neighborhood at the time. Uh, and um, it was an old construction company that was overgrown by kudzu and two buildings. And I mean, it was a neighborhood that nobody wanted. It was at a dead end. Nobody wanted to go down that street on East Avenue. 
and we just named it East 800 East because of the, the street we were on. And um, there was no alternative space in Atlanta at that time. And I had been in Atlanta coming from, New I had lived in New York for oh, 10 years, or it's hard to remember, but in the uh, late 70s, 80s, and fled from New York, really, uh, because of the AIDS epidemic. And everyone around me was dying, not really aware that it was the AIDS epidemic was everywhere, uh, but in, in Atlanta. But it's just, that's where I left. And so after being there for a little while, um, I had this idea of just seeing the need for an alternative space there. And, um, and so we started with nothing, with the space. We rented it for $450 a month. Uh, it was on five acres, uh, yeah. right, right across, you can look across and see the um, Carter Center. And um, I mean, I would watch Jimmy and Rosalind, happy birthday, Jimmy, um, right behind, um, I mean, where I would take a bath. I would take a bath in the kitchen uh, with a hose that would go over me in a, in a still a tub and pour the water out. And there would be Jimmy and Rosalind walking by um, on a path every morning, you know, when they were there every morning. And um, so little by little, we homesteaded the place. We cleared it all out of all the debris, uh, all the kudzu. And little by little, we made a space for uh, the disenfranchised in Atlanta. And it was uh, skater dudes and drag queens and everything in between. Awesome. Yeah, which is, of course, the, I mean, it's the, the, the foundation, the epitome of what socially engaged art is all about, what social practice art is. Right. You're doing this. I mean, you were doing that at a time when really we weren't even theoretically talking about social practice art and you were doing it. Right. Meaning sort of taking the. the no you know, talk what's practice. that? There was no talk of social practice. Right. Right. And but you were but you were doing it. That's the thing. Right. It, you felt it. It was it was just in your gut what you wanted to create, which was you wanted to sort of br somehow bring together public space and public experiences, art making with actually aiding the neighborhood, right? As you said, helping those that were disenfranchised and making them feel included, right? Creating a space of inclusion. Um, in general, for me, my I think one of my greatest interests in the issue of public space and how art can help public space. And when I say help, I mean, specifically, I mean, make it more accessible and more inclusive. I feel like that, that's always what I mean, right? Make people feel more invited in that space, make them want to linger in the space, make them want to talk to each other in the space, right? Instead of just run through the space on their phone, not paying attention to get to the next space, or if we're privileged enough, not even go into that space because we're privileged enough to circumvent the space in a, you know, a vehicle or whatever. Right? So I feel like the, the issue of making in general spaces and neighborhoods feel welcoming to all is to me very important, and I know it is to you. And doing that type of work, um, you know, at a time, and true, and this was the 90s, right? So this is like just before we all got sucked into the internet and then later social media and our cell phones, right? Which I think adds another layer to sort of our disengagement in the public, because, you know, I mean, have you, you know, you walk around in public space, and sometimes it's as much as like 80, 90% of the people are looking down right? Looking at their phones, they're sort of not like in the space, right? So it's an interest, it's interesting to me that you were doing that work and in your gut, you just wanted to create something that was welcoming and that brought people into the neighborhood. How long, um, how long was it up and running? It's eight years, eight or nine years. Long time. Okay. Mm -hmm. A long time. Really cool. It had a, a really big effect. Yeah. Uh, in, in Atlanta and on all of us who are working together, it's some of the best work I've ever done. And some of the, I mean, working with some of the best people I've, I've had the opportunity to work with um, people I still keep in touch with. And uh, we just we all honor that time because it was so rare and we were so genuine and sincere about just what we were doing. And things happened in a domino effect that we, we never anticipated. It was just we were just doing it, like you said, from our gut. And there was um, so many positive 
things that happen because of it, but just because we were following our, um, our, our gut, our good intentions. Yeah. You know, I believe, um, and I think you do as well, that, um, I mean, I know you do just from listening to, for example, your Ted talks, but I really think that, that art has a, has a healing effect not only can you know art in public spaces, I think, create more inclusive spaces, more inviting spaces, spaces that you know help interaction, which ultimately helps democracy. But I think art, art, art is healing in in a variety of ways, emotionally, spiritually, um, medically, right? And so, when in that experience, and in any other experience you've had, any other projects you've engaged in, have you seen that? Have you seen art? heal have you seen art sort of not only include people but like help people well i mean i've seen it help me um yeah. on a very personal level so much of my my work my personal work is about healing myself and um and rituals and a rites of passage that um also often from the gut where i i look at it later after doing it and to see how what what the transformation um was or or, or what, what it gave to me or, or information so i've seen i mean from teaching i've seen puppetry i've seen um uh, puppetry help uh, um someone who's a selective mute speak i've uh, seen um people come out of their um the horrible shyness that puppetry children and adults. Um, I've, you know, I've seen communities transform. Um, I could go on and on. I, I've seen, I mean, I've seen my mother, uh, which is what my TED talk is yeah. about, um, find her way back from dementia through art. Um, and um, I started, before I did 800 East, I had a gallery in my living room. It was called Living Room in Atlanta. And that's how I met the, the, a lot of the crew that had started 800 East is through opening a small, because um, I've always been uh, very much a proponent of use. Don't wait to be recognized. Don't wait to say, well, I can't do it because I don't have this or this or this. Use what you have around you. And there's no excuses really, except it's part of the um, elements of design of making sculpting the social action that you do with what you have around you so i didn't have a brick and mortar space i had my living room so i took everything out of my living room and i made a gallery uh, and i began to meet people uh, and um, from there we had our first show uh, someone gave us a space and we had our first show called life giving art art giving life Mm -hmm. And I think it's, um, and that's where that phrase came from uh, that I use in my TED talk. Um, I love that. Your... I love that title. It's a great one. Um, I'm thinking too about um, before we move on from this experience in Atlanta, um, specifically 800 East. I I keep thinking about how as one of these sort of early iterations of social practice art, like some might view it sort of more at the surface level, right? Okay, you revitalized a building, you brought it back to life and you created a space for art programming and art shows and artists to sort of come together and create. But I think there's this other layer to it, right? Where truly like in all social practice art, there's an element to the project that is like the art is actually completed by the participants, right? So yes, there was art taking place in that building, right? art shows, art performances, whatever you all were doing, but the entire experience is a work of art, right? The whole, everything is a work of art. The fact that people are walking through the door and participating and giving it community and giving it life, to me, that's the artwork too. Do you know what I mean? Like second layer, like the whole thing is a work of art. And that to me is what you created. Like that's the real art you create. It's great that you made a space where people could have art shows, but I think it's it's just so much more than that. Um, and sometimes I feel like that's what's hard to articulate about social practice projects, but it's what makes them so um, special and meaningful and um, compelling to me. Um, well, I would say, in, I mean, there are projects I do um, solo, um, and but um, 
these projects that we're talking about now, uh, it wasn't me who, it was a collective who materialized the results. Uh, it, it's always, so much of my work is working with amazing, hugely dedicated artists who are um, determined to uh, be change that are change makers and determined to create change and to see art as an everyday practice in their lives and, and around um, and the people around them. So um, it's uh, art is as life, uh, which is um, a phrase that Linda, my my one of my mentors and one of my most important mentors, Linda Mary Montano. Um, it's ascribes to life as art. I love that. Yeah. And I love that all these words you're using, you said change making, you've used transformation several times, which um, I feel so much. I feel like there's, and to me, art is always about transformation. And to me, that's why it's like inherent. You talk about art as a daily practice, right? Art is sort of habit, art is life. Um, I think that that to me, that approach is exactly what makes it inherently political, right? In that like through living art, you can make the world sort of as you want it, right? It has that transformative capacity, if, even if only for a moment, right? If only for a minute, if only for the time at 800 East in which everyone came together, right? And it's not that the whole world was changed and we fixed all the economic and political issues of exclusion and, and urban gentrification and all these things, but for, at least for that time and in those moments, the world is sort of as you wish it to be, right? You've transformed this moment into something where everybody is invited and everybody's together and everybody's making that change together. Um, I just feel like there's 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 something inherently political about all art in that it has that capacity. Like if it can transform, to me, that's that's a political possibility. Um, but even but especially in social practice projects like the ones that that like um, like so many of the work that you've done, we'll talk about art in odd places in just a minute. But um, sp still sticking with eight hundred East, that to me is it's the pro the fact that you made that happen is the art itself, right? Like I it's like and that's why social practice projects are so hard to sort of sometimes categorize, describe, photograph, because they're a whole, they're a whole moment. They're a whole community. They're a, they're a, right. So you're sort of providing this community political experience, but also providing the artistic experience. And I think transformation is like a big part of all of that. Um, I actually wanted to ask you something else that's related. Um, and I do want to get to art in odd places. But before we get there, just in general, you make a lot of art, both alone, both solo, with just a few people, with many people, with your students as part of art in odd places that are public performance pieces where you just you just go out on the street and you do art. You you don't you are not you know asking for permission. You're not on a, a particular stage. Right. You are you are using the streets truly as you wish to use them. And you're performing these interventionist acts. And I love that so much. I feel like I love all sorts of public art, but I really feel like um, you have really inspired me in that you you make space for you know this type of, sort of guerrilla interventionist art where you're not necessarily um, being asked or commissioned or asking for permission. It's not necessarily art in odd places is sort of a different issue, but it's not necessarily big and grand and organized. You're just sort of getting out there and you're doing it. And I feel like we need so much more of that. I would love to see more people just like just doing it, just putting themselves out there and using public space sort of as they wish and intervening in the world. And I just, um, I don't know, wonder if you could talk about some of your sort of favorite parts of those experiences, maybe some of the struggles with it, how you've seen it affect people, some of your favorite projects. I don't know. Any of any of that. Well, 800 East was one of my favorite projects ever, uh, just because of the collective. And we it was an ensemble. We worked for so many years together and we could intuit each other's moves and, and emotions. And and we worked as an ensemble for years. So so much of my of uh, the projects of creating spectacle with that group is uh and we'll, I mean it's just some of my favorite work. Um, and um, 
Let's think a minute. Um, there's a lot of questions. Um, yeah, I guess I mean, most of all, when you go out either by yourself or with others and you perform in the street, whether it's like the Keepers or a similar project, um, what compels you to make work like that? What do you love about it, you know? Well, I think uh, um, a couple of things come up with that question. I mean, one of the things I wanted to touch on is taking art outside of a privileged space and also um, creating, um, if you can help me remember, I want to talk about the, you said it's, um, it requires a huge amount of pre-planning and structure mm -hmm. and it's meticulously organized um, and designed and th thought out and scripted. So um, uh, impetus for doing this kind of work is, is uh, collecting data, I guess, information about how we communicate without um, the controls and perhaps elitist controlled spaces of a gallery or a theater or a museum where you can um, predict who will be there and, and it's controlled. Yeah. But in, in public space, I mean, and, and so as an artist, the the relationship between me and the audience is limited because of that and the so if the, it's a limited if that relationship is limited the information that i would garner from performing and the feedback i would get is limited and so um to more widely expand my thirst for information about that dynamic between the audience and the player or the artist is uh, public space. You can't control it as hard as you try. And that is part of the equation. So um, right away, the equation changes of that relationship. And through the years, I've learned so much and continue to, because it's an ever-changing space uh, that where you can feel the climate of where we are in the moment, you can feel sadness of a city you can feel the, the the desperation of of a time um so much is there and uh, and you can feel the happiness and the joy and the mm -hmm. and uh, uh, a bad day versus you know a bad hour in public space yeah. um so um planning to do something and you know taking into, into account that a lot of people in that space though could care less about art and so i've called for years i've called my audience the uninterested because i i'm on board with that i mm. mean it's, you know, a board if somebody comes yeah. at me with a clipboard i cross the street or i start looking at my phone i don't want to be bothered often with someone to tell me about some, it could be a performance. And, and I think a lot of people, if you're busy and you're on the sidewalk or in public space, you don't have time for art perhaps. And I think so over the years, I've learned that it's a mindful approach. It's, a, it's a, um, a respectful approach to the uninterested, that it's an offering, that we're not clobbering people over the head with our, um, our message, our, 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 my message of what I think things, how things could be or how things could be changed. It's a visual interruption uh, or a rupture in the habituation of the everyday. Is it, but it's an offering and hopefully a genteel, mindful offering um, is what I've learned over the years. And that's a, an ongoing search of how best and how best to communicate and learn to listen is part of that mm -hmm. relationship as well. Not just playing or being an artist, but, but stopping and observing. And, and sometimes, for instance, someone may see a fabulous, outrageous visual art piece, but then they might look up on a corner that they've walked by for, for years and see an architectural embellishment that they've never noticed before and suddenly that habitual walk has been interrupted by and, and it's like a 
um, hitting a ping pong ball or something that hits one place and goes off in another direction. I mean, the, the imagination sees something, but then it looks up and sees something else. And that interruption uh, is what I'm interested in. Yeah, I love that. I love that so much. I think I feel like exactly the same way. I love that you use the words interruption and rupture. Um, but you said, but, you know, gently, right? Not trying to sort of hit anyone over the head with it. But you said it's a it's an offering. It's a gift. What you do is is, is a, truly a gift. Um, and, you know, that idea that as people are walking down the street, they get you know, so many things. I want to try to put it together. All the all the different points you made. One, you're providing art in a non-privileged capacity, right? You're providing free access to art in public space. You don't have to take it. You don't have to pay attention to it, but it's there for you. You don't have to enter an institution. You don't have to enter a building in order to, you know, benefit from it. Um, and it's also, as you said, you know, not such a, a reserved or restricted relationship with the art making, right? You're not in a theater restricted to your seat so that you are watching. You're out in public space. So meaning you could decide to interact with the art or not interact or walk around it or take photos of it or talk to your friend about it. It's um, it's more open, right? And it's more um, spontaneous. All those points you made at the very beginning about how, how like fundamentally unpredictable public space is, is maybe what interests me the most about public space politically, because I think generally our lives, we structure our lives in a way that is familiar, right? We are um, able, if we want, if we wish to, almost completely see ourselves out of public space. But even if we do enter public spaces, we know sort of, we we try to plan for it, right? We try to plan for sort of how our lives are going to go. But you're right. When you enter the public, there is an, there is no matter, as you said, no matter how hard you try, you can't control it. Like it's going to be surprising. It's going to be unpredictable. That is inherently its nature. But that is why I think it's so, so important that we all sort of experience the public regularly um, and make it a habit because I think this is, you know, absolutely necessary, healthy um, for our political well-being, right? So that we as like citizens can interact with people in a spontaneous and unpredictable way, I think is so, so important so that we can learn. As you say, you talk about gathering information. You're talking about that from the perspective of the artist, but also the perspective of say the political theorist. I think citizens in general need to gather more information about people and experiences and spaces around them. And so often we don't have that information because if we're just spending time in the same places with the same people watching the same news, right, then we're having a bit, we're getting a very sort of limited slice um, of life rather than like a diverse and more unpredictable slice. And so how do we get more information about more people? Go outside, right? Absolutely. Go outside. And then how do we increase that information? I think exactly what you said. One, at least one way is to have that artistic experience that is surprising, right? Like that you said is an interruption, is a rupture, some type of sort of intervention in the in the regular of the daily, right? And once you have that, you explain that beautifully, right? You, you might hopefully notice something else that you had failed to notice all the other times that you'd walk down that street. You might sort of have a different experience, a different moment, have a different and causing a different emotion. And now your day is different maybe not to be dramatic, maybe your life is slightly different, right? By sort of having this new moment. So for sort of all the reasons, I'm just wondering, for all the reasons that you're saying that making art in this way is so important to you, I think it's also so, so important to generally the health of society and of, of democracy, because I think it's just easier and easier and sort of easier to not, for, for especially if you are privileged enough to not have to, to sort of see your way out of so many unpredictable, spontaneous public experiences. And then that sort of to me, engaging with an artwork like one of your performances um, is like an added benefit. It's like you're already out in the public, right? You're maybe gathering the information of the everyday, but hopefully, right, the dream is that that gift that you're making, that art sort of moment that you're presenting does something to that person, whether it's big or small, right? They have some kind of, they, they have some type of pause where they reconsider, they think, they connect, they have an emotion, they share it with someone, right? And now their day is just a little bit different, 
right? Their sort of regular commute, whatever has been interrupted. And they've now thought about that space differently. Maybe they've thought about their own lives differently, um, themselves differently. And I feel like that's really, really important because we, there's, I would say there's almost, there's no greater benefit to democracy than having people engaged in the public and having, you know, transformative, spontaneous experiences in the public. I think that's really, really, really important. And so that's why I think these types of performances are so important politically, not just artistically, because I value them and I enjoy them, but because I think they're, they're doing valuable things for, for the community and for sort of democracy broadly. Um, So I, you know, I thank you for doing these, these, these interruptions, these ruptures and trying to rupture that daily. I think we all need more ruptures. Like, I think we just, it's just a benefit to sort of have a break in, in what is expected, in what we know, in the familiar. Um, I think breaks are really, really powerful. Um, going back to that word transformation, right? They're really powerful in helping us to see things differently. You know, sometimes it's, you just need sort of like, you know, sometimes you just need like the slightest change in perspective, the slightest change in your day, sometimes to make you think about like everything differently. So I feel like ruptures are really important and we don't really get them in public life. And outside of um, artistic interventions, everything else you see visually, I mean, outside of art, think about what we all see publicly besides our own phones and the humans around us everything else is sort of, is advertising, right? Anything else you see that's sort of visual, um, besides of course the actual landscape, like the architecture, the, the sidewalks, right? The spaces that you're standing in, the other sort of visual add-ons um, are advertising, which to me is sort of a different type of, of visual experience. Um, and it's usually not an interruption or not a rupture. You've seen it all before. It's another Verizon ad, right? It's not sort of taking you out of that daily moment in the way you were describing. But if I were to come across the keepers in your keeper suits, now that's gonna that's gonna make me pause. I'm going to I'm gonna notice that and I'm gonna have Maybe. an experience with that. Maybe it oh. depends on what you've got yeah. going on in life. I mean, people will walk right by because they've got a, a lot going on. They've got, you know, four kids and they've got three jobs and they're they care less about art um, at that moment. And so, I mean, and that's completely understandable. I wonder though if even if you even though I love that you called it what did you call it, the audience the the uninterested 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 I would you know that's another that's a whole nother thing that I've I've always sort of thought about that you know I'm so interested in public art and and socially engaged art and how we can get art to more people and make it more accessible and make it less privileged and make it part of everyday life but yeah a lot of people aren't going to care I mean that's very clear right people are just going to walk by it but I I mean, I, yeah. I, I completely agree. I mean, moments, I, I mean, I don't care about art. I don't care about being bothered with anything that might have to do with entertainment or enjoyment of art, or I just need a moment. And, and that's you know, completely understandable. I mean, the audience at um, a Broadway matinee is a particular audience that goes to see a Broadway matinee. And it's, I mean, and they, I'm sure are changed and have a moment where they reflect or, or, or makes them think about another part of their life besides uh, SpongeBob. Um, it, it, and that's beautiful too. I mean, like a painting will do yeah. or, a, you know, an installation in a gallery. I mean, all of that is still equally important to me, yeah. um, even though I've never, you know, waited and still haven't really, uh, perhaps a little, um, after many, many decades of working to um, be recognized by institutions, press, or um, academia. Uh, it's, um, it's a, uh, and, and that's part of all of the, the message I think all of us working on these different projects agree upon too, is that don't wait. Um, and that's the sort of the legacy that we hope to to impart is to do the work, life as art, and don't wait to be recognized. Don't wait for brick and mortar. Art in odd places doesn't have brick and mortar. Don't wait for grants, uh, art in odd places until very, very recently for 
over, I mean, 16 years yeah. grants, um, maybe, maybe a little bit less than that, but uh, years and years without any sort of funding was just the, the, on the generosity of everyone involved. I mean, I wouldn't want to diminish my role in what happens, but it certainly is a collective that actually makes each of these projects happen. Yeah, um, which takes us beautifully to art and odd places. Um, you know, and I like to think, I, which is a nice sort of transition here that, you know, yes, there are those people that are actively inviting art into their lives. They're going to see, the, they're walking into the gallery, they're walking into the theater, and hopefully they're having beautiful transformative experiences um, indeed. And then there's the people that are just, for whatever reason, going to walk right by the public performance and really are not going to feel moved by it or, or con you know, won't contemplate it, et cetera. But I like to think that the work that um, that is done by public artists there's that there's is really important for that like other group there's like a third group of people and they're the people i think that maybe aren't actively making the decision or, or maybe don't have the ability um to easily walk into these institutions where you have to pay to to see the art or to experience the art but but they will pause and they will be moved by it and they will contemplate it right and so i feel like that work is really really important for that group of people so you know sometimes cuz sometimes i hear people detracting you know talking about public art like oh well so many people don't care what is really the point you're not really changing anything they're just walking by on their phones but i think that's that's a really you know while that's as you said it's undoubtedly true it's it's life we're humans not everyone is going to be ready for it every day but there's that other group of people that you're affecting right that maybe haven't had a chance or haven't been in a while to experience art in a direct conscious way and are now getting the chance right or having this type of creative transformative experience however they have it whatever it does for them but i do think that group exists and so that's really, really important, right? Like you're still, you're making art for the people, um, for people, and 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 it, it does exist. I, I promise. How they take it or how they have it or however they handle it, you know, however, yeah. they, however it enters in or however it affects. I mean, it's a, it's, you know, it's for me, it's an equation. And you set up all the, you know, look at all the variables, uh, look at all the, the possibilities, create a scaffolding of, the script of what will happen and then watch it to see where the moment might happen if there is a moment uh, i love that so you're like setting up the moment and it's not going to happen the same way for everyone and maybe some people will reject the moment but you're providing them the possibility the opportunity mm -hmm. um for that moment to happen um on that note please let's talk about art not places um which is which has gotten so big um, it's coming up really soon. So I know you're really busy working on it. Um, what, what is really sort of special and significant about art and odd places for you? Tell us a little bit about it. Art and odd places, places, visual and performance art. This is my elevated speech. Um, along uh, its most pure model is it places visual and performance art along 14th Street in Manhattan uh, from Avenue C to the Hudson River. And it's a, any sort of art that is possible um, is possible on 14th Street and is re usually reacting to a focus or a theme each year that's usually one word. This year, the word is dress. And um, it's created by one year might be 110 artist projects and some projects have 30 people in them or one year I think it had 25 projects this year there are 35 projects artist projects people uh, apply uh, in an open call uh, we have a project coming from Sri Lanka a project coming from India a project coming from the UK Canada uh, Italy um, California, Nevada, uh, New Yorkers, uh, and uh, a couple other places that I forgot to mention, but everyone responding to the theme dress and using courage, but not necessarily using the sidewalk as a runway or a way to show your 
uh, response to dress and uh, whatever that might mean for that particular artist. So um, that's pretty, that's it in that show. That was a long elevator ride. Yeah, that was great. I know. Um, I like that. And it's, it's interesting because it's different than obviously all public performances, as you said, require planning, right? Um, right so this, is just, this is installation as well. It's, it's installation, installation as well. it's tours, it's online new media. It's um, a variety of different work. So a lot of different types of art making coming together, but essentially curated like one exhibit except the exhibit is not inside an, an institution, but it's on the streets using the sidewalk as sort of the the, the gallery space, um, which I love. So you can interact with the the art nod places experience, you know, in so many different ways. You can find different types of art within it. Um, you can go down there just for the sort of the joy. Do you feel like when it happens, when it takes place, there's a sort of uh, festival feel, there's sort of joy in the air, there's a lot of people buzzing about and sort of experiencing the art, making the art, interacting, talking about it. Is it, does it feel like a community sort of, a community is born every time out of it? Yes. Yeah. It has that, yes, I do. <laughs> As it has sort of that, what the feel, and which yeah. I love. Yeah. <laughs> you can, I mean, it just, when I sit back and watch, outside as far away from the concentric circles of observation as I can, because that's where the real information is for me, after all these years, is uh, I, I watch that sort of, what's going on? Um, it's, something's different. I mean, I just mm -hmm. I saw something really strange down the block, right. uh, sort of experience some people. Uh, and then I also watch, like I said, people walk right by um, as well. Yeah, well, it is New York City. I mean, of you know, course, you see a lot in New York City. So if you're there a lot, you get a, you get pretty accustomed to that. Um, you know, which is I also think is really interesting. Enacting art not places in other places, right? In other, you know, maybe spaces, um, outdoor spaces that are a little um, smaller, um, a little less populated, um, and you know that I'm sure you've had many different experiences sort of how the project sort of changes according to the public space that it's in um which is also really interesting to me right like you're when you choose the space that you create art in the space itself matters right what kind of space is it who's using it where is it like you talk about 800 east being in a space that was being going to be demolished right is a derelict space derelict area that was not sort of being cared for and then you go in there and make the most of it now that's very different than deciding to enact work in you know the center of manhattan such as 14th stream is the center of downtown it's a really it's an active corridor, right? A, a commuting space. Um, so making sort of different choices of spaces um, is also sort of really important. With art in odd places, have you um, have you sort of loved seeing it leave New York and go to different places and create different experiences as a result of that? Oh, it's, it's been wonderful to see people's reaction. I mean, every time, um, the most pure model is in New York. Uh, when I travel, I'm usually working with the city or I'm working with um, a civic organization. And because of that, we have to get permission to use the space. Mm -hmm. And so that changes things right away. It becomes less of a less of a political political action in a way for me uh, because we've asked for permission. And uh, with when you ask for permission, there are certain things that you then have to also do and then there's a little bit of censorship that happens and you have to be a little bit more flexible it becomes what they've called place making a little bit of place making is going on then because it's not this um un independent yeah uh action but there's still lots of information there i mean my dream one day would be to have a, a merry bandit a uh, troop that would travel the world in different cities and do these interventions with the people who live there independently with no permissions and 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 collect all this information about how do we communicate uh, I mean I think it was Peter Brook uh, the director um, who traveled the world and finally found the best way to actually set a stage 
regardless of where he was, was to roll a, roll a piece of carpet out. And that would be the stage. And that worked everywhere he went. Um, I remember that story. And, I love that. You know, and that took years to learn what, how do you create a stage somewhere, anywhere that's universal? And I guess rolling out a piece of carpet just set the stage wherever he was. Yeah, that's a beautiful dream. I hope that you get to do that um, someday. But I love that idea of moving it around, right? That sort of moving art and taking the same idea and putting it in different places, which what is what you're already doing with art, not places. But I see your point to make it sort of fully interventionist and in that sense make it a fully independent political action right to just do it to not ask for permission to to go into the space as it is not a space that's at all been sort of curated or cleaned or you know created a permission for but rather you just go in and you use the space as it is which i think is really really important and that's what i think i i love the most about the work that you do and so i like that beautiful dream please let me know if you're going to do that so i can join the troop <laughs> I mean, um, my Venmo account is um, <laughs> typing it. <laughs> Here it is. That would Thank take you so much. A lot of funds, I'm sure, and then yeah. then it becomes maybe a different animal as well. Um, but it, it would still be a wonderful dream if we had enough um, capital that was um, given freely without uh, any constraints. Or yeah. Thinking about 800 East again, we started there, we're ending there as well. Wouldn't that be amazing too, if you could go around and find, you know, a space, a, a sort of derelict space, any in any space city that you go to and try to do a similar action, take that space and say, we're now going to make it this inclusive art making space um, and sort of see what happens. And in each place, I'm sure it would take off and become its own its own experience that was that is unique in and of itself but that would also be a really sort of interesting way to sort of take the same project and move it along which i love in general about public works that you can um so many of them at least you can move you can put them in different places right and you can sort of create the same experience but it's going to be a new experience because it's being affected by the space that it's in and the community that's in that it's in um so that's something else that i think is really interesting so i love that um, thank you so much, Ed. This has been really great. Um, thank you for sharing all of that with us, talking with us about um, your projects. I'm going to make sure that we're going to link to all of those projects and to some photos um, in the, at the bottom of the video so that those listening can actually see some of this visually, which I think would, would be really um, helpful. So thank you so much for coming on Hosting Art. I really appreciate it. And I hope we can talk again soon. Mm -hmm.